sex. Everyone talks about it, most people want it. But why? It turns out we've all got sex on the brain. Science says it's not just about attraction or biology. In fact, sex might be more mental than physical. We're pulling back the sheets to uncover what really drives desire on today's episode of The Infographic Show, why your brain is wired for sex. First of all, why do people have sex? It's pretty simple. It's so the human species can evolve. Humans and most animals have an evolutionary edge over organisms that reproduce through parthenogenesis, where the female decides to just give birth to a new organism on her own. And that advantage is genetic variety. By mixing genes with a partner, offspring are more adaptable and better equipped to survive whatever unpredictable future the environment throws their way. But you're probably not thinking about any of that while you're trying to unhook someone's bra. But deep down, your brain is hardwired to seek out a partner whose genes, when combined with yours, might give your future offspring the best shot at survival and ensure that 50% of you lives on. That drive becomes even more urgent when something is wrong in your environment or resources seem limited. Researchers weirdly came to this conclusion by studying animals that sometimes replicate through parthenogenesis and sometimes through sex. Monitor lizards, for example, will generally choose to have offspring through parthenogenesis when all is well. Food is everywhere and the climate is doing great. However, when there are stressors in the environment, like a toxic spill, they will usually choose sex over parthenogenesis. So even animals that can reproduce alone choose to combine genes when the future seems uncertain. But if that rule were true for humans, we'd all be having the most sex of our lives in this current climate. So clearly, human brains are a little more complicated when it comes to sex. To see why, let's examine the first step on the way to sex. For those with any standards, it's usually attraction to another person. But why and how do we even get attracted to people in the first place? Ever looked across the room and saw someone smiling at you? Then you immediately spill your drink on yourself and look like an idiot? Well, it's because your brain is releasing a whole slew of hormones to make you fall in lust and possibly love, primarily dopamine and oxytocin, though we'll get into the specifics of those and other chemicals later. And those are released because, contrary to conventional wisdom, you don't fall in love with your heart, but rather with a combination of your hypothalamus, ventral tegmental area, and nucleus accumbens. But that doesn't sound nearly as romantic. And research shows that it's not just looks turning you on to drive you toward reproduction. A person's voice, symmetry, and even body odor can make your hypothalamus and amygdala sing. In addition to giving clues about your gender and age range, your voice contains hints about a lot more to a prospective partner, including indicators about your health, fertility, and even body shape. Researchers, including evolutionary psychologist Gordon Gallup, conducted an experiment in which they had students count from 1 to 10 in what we were sure was a very sexy way. And then they played the recordings for other students. The female voices rated the most attractive tended to be higher pitched and were also correlated to having a smaller waist to hip ratio, meaning that stereotypically hourglass figure men tend to find attractive in women. The male voices rated the most attractive were deeper and also correlated to a big shoulder to hip ratio, meaning broad shoulders and a back shape like a V. It turns out there's a good evolutionary reason for people's voices giving us a lot of information about their appearance and reproductive potential. As Gallup says, back when humans dwelled in caves and they didn't have electricity, when the sun went down, if you interacted with somebody, it would be based largely on the sound of their voice. You wouldn't be able to see their face. Even today, most questionable late-night hookup decisions happen under the cover of darkness. So back in prehistoric times, when pitch black nights were the norm, it made perfect sense that our ancestors learned to pick up on important clues just from the sound of someone's voice. In fact, one of Gallup's other studies even found a small correlation between the attractiveness of a woman's voice and the point at which she is in in her menstrual cycle. Women's voices during ovulation, when they're fertile, are rated the most attractive. Now on to smell. One of the most disgusting experiments ever conducted on the attractiveness of odor involved dozens of men wearing a t-shirt over a Sunday and Monday night so it could absorb their sweat and scent. Then instead of washing the shirts like normal people, scientists asked a bunch of women to smell them, which sounds like a kink we would rather not learn more about. Women then rated the shirt smell in terms of pleasantness, intensity, and sexiness without ever getting a look at the men who had worn them. When scientists examined who the women picked as the most pleasant and sexy, it was generally men who had the most dissimilar genes to the women, especially when it came to their MHC, or Major Histocompatibility Index. And that is actually a huge evolutionary win. If a woman mates with a man with dissimilar genes, 
it increases the chance that their children will not only be relatively attractive, but that her immune system will end up complementing her mate's immune system. This creates especially healthy children who are protected against a wider array of diseases. Weirdly, men don't seem to have this ability to detect immune system differences via smell. Scientists hypothesize that that's because it's more costly for a woman to become pregnant in terms of time and energy invested and physical risk taken. So she has to be really sure that she is making the right decision when picking sexual partners in an era before birth control. Though more complex factors are also at play, the importance of someone's voice and odor in sexual attraction might be why you almost immediately lose interest in some people after you start chatting with them, or why your last 57 hinge dates haven't gone so well. Laura Germain, associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, agrees. She says many have had the experience of where someone who is very attractive initially rapidly becomes unattractive after interacting with them in 5 to 10 minutes, because now, you're integrating all of this other social information. Or maybe you have some stuff to work out in therapy. Next, we'll get the facial symmetry. A study by Little and Jones presented photos of people alongside photos of them altered to look perfectly symmetrical. Participants were given the photos, but not told which was which. They were then asked to rate which face was more attractive and which was more symmetrical. The faces were then inverted, and they were asked to rate which one was more attractive and then symmetrical. Clearly, people rated the upright faces as much more attractive than the inverted ones, but their ability to detect symmetry didn't change at all. The study showed that even when people didn't realize it, they could detect symmetry subconsciously. To scientists, this showed that there must be evolutionary reasons that people can detect symmetry in faces. And it turns out, there is. In a study by Fink, Neve, Grammer, and Manning, participants were asked to rate the photos of strangers for attractiveness, health, and positive personality traits. People with more symmetrical faces consistently rated high in all of those factors. Meanwhile, those with less symmetrical faces were perceived as more anxious, generally not a positive quality. However, the research on whether symmetry and health are actually correlated, in reality as well as in people's minds, is a little less clear. A 1990 study found that bilaterally symmetrical development can show health in the body, while oxidative stress linked to rapid aging tends to decrease facial symmetry as a person grows older. Therefore, symmetry may also be a reflection of how young a person has stayed in terms of their health and body. This would naturally result in higher levels of sexual attraction as both male and female fertility decreases drastically with age. However, a study published in Nature magazine in 2017 studied the links between facial traits and health in both men and women. It found almost no correlation in women and very weak correlations in men. Further studies need to be done on the topic, but it seems that as human beings we still think of symmetry as being related to health on a subconscious level. So the reality doesn't really matter to us when we're judging someone as a prospective sexual partner. Now all of that, odor, voice, appearance, and symmetry, combines to become the X factor that people say they can't put their finger on when they're attracted to someone. But what does your brain actually do after it's detected this chemistry with someone? In 2005, one of the most well-known researchers on love and human attraction, Dr. Helen Fisher, scanned the brains of 2,500 college students while they were looking at pictures of people they romantically loved. Then they were scanned again when they were looking at neutral acquaintances. Two areas lit up like Christmas lights when the students were looking at pictures of someone they were in love with. The caudate nucleus, a region that deals with reward detection and expectation, and the ventral tegmental area, part of the brain's reward circuit that deals with pleasure, the motivation to pursue rewards, and focused attention. This might sound cute at first, their brains associated pictures of their love with rewards and pleasure, until Dr. Helen Fisher points out that this brain reaction is very similar to the response of addicts' brains when they use drugs. Basically, when you're first attracted to someone and falling in romantic love, you are high. Which is also why people in the first couple of months of deep attraction usually operate with all the rationality of heroin addicts. And those aren't our words, but those of Harvard Medical School. The brain releases massive amounts of dopamine when someone in love focuses on the object of their affection. This activates the reward circuit and makes love a pleasurable experience similar to the euphoria associated with the use of cocaine or alcohol. Which is why, when we get rejected for sex or attachment, we frequently turn to those vices. And it's not just us, fruit flies do exactly the same thing. One 2012 study published in the Science Journal by researchers at the University of California, San Francisco, found that fruit flies who were sexually rejected drank four times more than the fruit flies who got their wings clapped. Studies like that are important. 
because they remind us that the lives of a lot of researchers, like those spending their days waiting to see how much fruit flies drink and bang, are truly weird. In any case, it's clear that your brain reacts to sex and sexual attraction like it does to addictive drugs, and it does not cope well if it doesn't get it. When you feel lust, the primary part of your brain that activates is the hypothalamus. To understand how basic the need for reproduction is, the hypothalamus is also the part of the brain that controls hunger and thirst. It's also tied to the autonomic nervous system, including your heart and respiratory rate. And that's partly why the reward circuit activation that happens during sexual attraction leads to physical symptoms, sweaty palms, flushed cheeks, anxiety, sped up heartbeat, as well as an increase in cortisol, the stress hormone. The release of cortisol helps explain why when we're first attracted to someone, it rarely feels like a peaceful experience and more like a 24-hour roller coaster ride. You're torn between blissful euphoria and freaking out over analyzing every word your crush said for indications that they secretly hate you. High levels of cortisol cause serotonin to drop, which then produces similar symptoms to those of OCD and anxiety sufferers, intrusive thoughts, preoccupation, and irrational fears, just to name a few. And that's why you find yourself checking your phone every three minutes for a text and then breaking down crying in the bathroom after six hours without one. Weirdly enough, the sex part of the sexual attraction actually calms you down because the hypothalamus takes over once again to get you to finally chill out. After this chaos of dopamine, cortisol, and serotonin that's erupted in your body during and after sex, your brain releases hormones that trigger much happier symptoms. These chemicals are oxytocin and vasopressin, released both in men and women during sex, though in different amounts. Oxytocin is released both during sex and during extensive skin-to-skin -skin contact. It makes people feel closer to each other, deepening feelings of intimacy and attachments to the person you've just had sex with. That's why oxytocin is nicknamed the love hormone. As opposed to the insanity happening in your brain and body during attraction, oxytocin release causes calmness, contentment, and security. Though it's released in both genders during sex, it's released more so in women. Vasopressin, on the other hand, is released in both genders as well, but much more so in men. It's generally associated with behaviors including commitment, protectiveness, and heightened responsibility, as well as monogamy, basically things that lead to loyalty and long-term relationships. Both those hormones also deactivate parts of the brain that tend to trigger negative emotions, social judgment, as well as the screening that we subconsciously do for others' intentions and emotions. So there is actually a scientific basis for love being blind, or rather, love completely overlooking someone's glaring, screaming flaws and crappy behavior. Your brain is literally making you unable to see them. Strangely, the brain structures involved in attraction are similar to those involved in aggression. The amygdala has a huge initial reaction to cues of either love or conflict, and then the hypothalamus determines your response to both, which may explain why some people have great sex with exes or even current partners that they constantly fight with. Those two neural pathways are just getting very confused in their brains. We still recommend against it. That being said, there are limits to the strength of humans' reproductive drive. Caltech professor David Anderson and his graduate student Gloria Choi did tests on male mice, exposing them to both cat odor and female mouse urine. For those of you confused as to why, female mouse urine is known as a turn-on for male mice, and hopefully a turn-off for everyone else. But hey, we're not here to kink shame. In fact, it turns mice on so much that they start a courtship song, or in a less sexy, more scientific term, ultrasonic vocalization. But if that same female mouse urine is paired with the scent of a predator like a cat, the urge to sing gets overridden by the urge to not be killed and eaten. Mice exposed to both smells will stop making noise and hide. Basically, science's way of saying that the urge to have sex is powerful, but the urge to survive is still more powerful. Or as Anderson says, the asymmetry in the crosstalk suggests that the system is prioritized for survival first, mating second. Which makes sense because staying alive is the first step toward reproducing. Only the fastest among us would be able to climax and pass on their genes in the time it takes a predator to cross a room and kill them. Strangely, many species manage to evolve beyond pure lust and reproductive drive into pursuing long-term relationships. How is that possible? Wouldn't it seem counterproductive to trying to reproduce as much as you can? To staying bonded to just one mate for years? Well, aside from the social pressures toward monogamy, there's an evolutionary and biological basis for a drive toward monogamy. According to University of California researchers Evelyn Mercado 
and Leah Heibel, the transition to monogamy solved a variety of evolutionary challenges but required the co-opting of biological systems for its conception and ongoing success. The problems long-term relationships solve include long-term infant care, as human babies are uniquely helpless and useless for the first few years of their lives, especially compared to the rest of the animal kingdom. There's also decreased male-on-male -male competition and fighting over partners, which enabled the growth of tribes, communities, and eventually societies. The fascinating part is that our body essentially used the hormonal effects of lust and sexual attraction to transition into long-term companionship, mainly the chemicals oxytocin and vasopressin. The repeated release of these hormones in lovers who have sex and spend a lot of time cuddled up bonds them together in a biological way, and since they cause calmness, contentedness, as well as feelings of loyalty and connection, they turn people toward long-term relationships. Other hormones that initially cause alternating spikes of anxiety and happiness, high dopamine and low serotonin, start to return to normal levels after six months to a year, leaving only the calmer, more content feelings caused by the love hormones. That's when most couples pass out of the honeymoon phase and into discussions about who does the laundry and what amount of texting is appropriate with a full-time career and hobbies. Falling asleep on the phone with your partner every night that you're not together might be very cute in the beginning, but eventually your body realizes that you also have to get back to having a full-time life as well. However, it's important to note that the interaction and cycling of the honeymoon and post-honeymoon phase chemicals doesn't stop entirely at this point. There isn't usually a completely linear path from lust and sexual attraction to romance and content monogamy. Disruptions can occur, both positive and negative, that reflood the brain with dopamine. For instance, getting those feelings of romance to kick back in or cause cortisol levels to spike, creating the insecurity of initial attachments. And that's why couples who want to stay monogamous and partnered up need to keep the romance alive. Oxytocin and vasopressin are linked to the brain's dopamine reward system, meaning that those little moments of affection and connection can literally keep the good feelings going. But it's just as important to manage conflict and stress. Too much cortisol can flood the system and trigger anxiety, not just in general but about the relationship itself. Now, we know you probably have another question on your mind. Are men and women different when it comes to these impulses of sexual attraction and eventual attachment? Perhaps, perhaps not. Honestly, the research points in both directions depending on which study you're looking at. It's a topic that's really hard to research without any bias on the part of those conducting the studies in either direction. For example, one study by Nicole Prouse, a research scientist at UCLA Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior, organized a bunch of participants to gauge their brain's reaction on EEG to intimacy-themed images. Some were more tame, a couple kissing, for example, and others were more explicit. Some people's brains reacted only to the explicit images, while others' brains reacted to almost every image with the slightest hint of intimacy. Researchers found that those who had a higher number of sexual partners in the previous year exhibited late positive potential responses to both the graphic and less graphic images. Those who had few partners showed reduced responses to the less explicit images and a bigger response to the more graphic ones. However, when they compared men and women among the participants, they didn't find any difference in either of their reactions to the suggestive images. One difference multiple studies have found is that men tend to have a higher sex drive that is more independent of context. Meanwhile, women's sex drives tend to be influenced more by social and environmental factors, meaning on average, a woman's sex drive is more responsive and must be turned on, but a man can most likely just wake up horny for no particular reason. When it comes to turning lusts to monogamy, relationship expert Esther Perel points out that the latest research has found interesting and culturally unexpected differences in men and women. She states, research shows that men remain much more interested sexually in a partner for a longer time, with shifts being more gradual. Women tend to lose their interest in a shorter amount of time and rather precipitously. All that being said, scientists who study sex, love, and attraction like Dr. Fisher warn against making sweeping conclusions. Yes, our bodies and brains have evolved to respond in certain ways, and modern social pressures shape our behaviors. But short-term sexual impulses and long-term attachment are deeply personal. They're shaped by our environment, culture, life experiences, and countless other factors we often don't even notice. So even if we understand the biology behind it all, the way we experience love and desire remains uniquely our own. So if your brain is hardwired to seek out sex, could that instinct alone be enough to save humanity? Watch Could Two People Actually Repopulate Earth to find out, or click on this video instead.